Well, good evening, guys. So good to see y'all. Welcome tonight to MMZ Students Wednesday Night Bible Study. Hope that you're doing well. Hope that your life is going well. And uh, just so good to see y'all Sunday. I uh, hope you enjoyed our services and being back in the sanctuary for the first time in a couple months. Uh, looking forward to it again this Sunday. Uh, in the meantime, we're still kind of stuck online and some of our other things for right now, but in time it will get better. We will be able to do activities. We will be able to do things, but we're going to continue to, to study together in the meantime. And so uh, we're going to open up with a word of prayer and then we'll dive into the message tonight. Father God, uh, I come to you right now so thankful that I'm called by you as one of your own. Father, I'm so thankful that I, I get to serve a God that loves me in spite of me. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would be with our students, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. God, I pray that you would use this time to draw them together spiritually, God, so that they can be strengthened by your word. We know that your word is alive, it is well, and Father, we pray that it would speak life into us. Father, we pray that it would be living water for our dry and thirsty souls in which we live in this world. Lord, we give you all the glory for anything that comes out of this, and it's your name we pray, amen. And amen. Okay, guys. Well, tonight uh, we're going to start part two of this series. Uh, last week we were in, in part one where we talked about trials. And this week we're moving into temptations. And we probably won't finish. And there's probably a few more messages that we're going to get out of this. But that's okay. Uh, but last week we talked about trials. And, and in these verses that we look at uh, tonight in James chapter 1 verses 13 and 14... Uh, we're going to see that we transitioned from last week's message on verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man who per perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so James dealt with trials. And then we're going to move into our verses for tonight, which is verses 13 and 14. And it says this, Let no one say he's tempted by God, because God cannot be tempted by evil, for he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And uh, when we think about that, these verses come immediately after James finishes teaching about trials because they kind of go hand in hand because there's a lot of confusion sometimes about those. Um, and last week we talked about how a trial is sent by God. It is, it is a test designed by God to grow us and strengthen us and to make us better followers of Jesus Christ. And it's important that we see the connection here because the same basic Greek word translated trials in James 1.12 is used in the verb form here uh, when it's talking about being tempted in James 1.13. So, in fact, it's the same throughout all of the New Testament, uh, which tells us that the same event can either be a trial or a temptation, really depending on the purpose of it and oftentimes how we respond to it. And so the difference is that a trial is created or allowed by God to strengthen us in the faith and advance our spiritual growth. On the flip side, a temptation is very different. It's a solicitation, which is a big word, or enticement, which is another big word. But basically, it's a way to get us to do evil that comes from Satan or his demons. So it's an invitation by Satan himself to disobey or, or rebel against God's nature with the goal of limiting our capacity to bring God glory. Because ultimately, that's what we're here to do. That's why he leaves us here, to bring him glory, whether it's in our, in our walk, whether it's in our spreading of the gospel. We are here to bring God's glory. And we see that uh, in our response to sin, it's important how we respond to that. When we fail or fall into temptation and it becomes sin, we often immediately feel the guilt of it. And in fact, if you feel guilty immediately after your sin, that's probably a good sign that you're saved because the Holy Spirit immediately begins to go to work and convicts you of that sin. Satan, in turn, will oftentimes use that guilt. Guilt is a good thing. Guilt is used for, by God in order to point us back in the right direction. Satan will use that same guilt, though, and convince us that we can never be clean again that we've done so bad and done so much that we can never come back. God can't use us anymore, and he's sickened by the very sight of us. So instead of doing what we need to do, and immediately, once we sin, turn and repent of that sin and run back to God, we often do much like Adam and Eve did. We want to hide in the garden. We want to hide our sin because we are ashamed. Um, so it's not true. God doesn't look at us and get sickened because of our sin. He still loves us, and, uh, and we allow it oftentimes to destroy us. So why does Satan tempt us? Well, first of all, you need to understand, number one, the reality of temptation. 
the reality of temptation. Know this, friends. Satan has one goal in this life, and that is to defeat you. That is to defeat you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, for your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's saying, be alert, guys. The enemy is around you. You are surrounded by the enemy. And we look at this in this scripture. God doesn't tempt us. God doesn't want us to sin at all. Let no one say he's tempted by God. For he cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. It's Satan that does that. So we need to understand one thing. Satan has hate in his heart, okay? Satan has hate in his heart, and there is nothing redeemable about him in any way. His ways are always despicable. He hates God, and he will do anything he can to hurt God. That's his goal. The problem is he can't touch God. God is all-powerful. God kicked him out of heaven. He can't touch God. So he, in turn, comes after the next best thing. You know what that is, don't you? Well, that's us. Yeah, we are the, the crown of God's creation. We are his pride and joy, and Satan wants nothing more than to destroy us. So since the beginning of man, Satan has been coming after us. And you need to understand that Satan can turn any trial that God has set aside for good into a temptation to defeat you and to drag you down. And we look at that in the Garden of Eden. Um, God in the, the tree in the midst of the garden was simply a trial that God placed by Adam and Eve. And through their, their withstanding and their, their going through that trial, it would grow them in their relationship with God. But Satan found a way to turn it into a temptation. So God designed the trial. Satan twisted it and turned it into that temptation. At other times, we see that trials and temptations are very different. They're not the same at all. There is no way that a temptation to commit sexual sin or murder or lie or steal can be called any kind of thing sent by God because God does not tempt anyone. The Bible is very clear about that. God will never test our faith by setting us up to sin. So you need to understand that. God will never test our faith by setting us up to sin. Guys, God doesn't want to tempt you. He can't tempt you. James knew, though, that we would be tempted to blame God for our temptations. And that's why he wrote it very clearly there in the 13th verse of chapter 1, so that he might, you know, proverbially nip that in the bud, that it's not God that tempts us. Will he try you? Oh, yeah. Will he test you? Yes. Will he tempt you? Never. Never. Also, it's good to note that while the devil can tempt you, he cannot force you to sin. So you can't say the devil made you do it because the devil cannot make you do anything. He can wrap up the temptations in the prettiest wrapping paper you've ever seen and make it everything you want it to be, make it inviting, but ultimately he is powerless to make you sin, period. No way. So you need to understand that there is, a, there is a reality out there that temptation is going to come, and it is coming from the tempter, Satan himself. But also there is, the one more thing I want you to look at tonight is that there is a progress of temptation. So temptation has, has a progress that it goes through. Look at verses 14 and 15, where it says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust." And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So there's two verses that you should know by heart, and that's these. And, it, and you need to keep them close at hand because these are very valuable verses for us to understand as Christians in our battle against Satan every day. The reason being these verses spell out clearly for us the way that temptation progresses into sin. It begins as a simple thought or an idea, maybe something planted there by Satan himself in order to try to, to bring us down. And then that thought or that idea leads to an action, and that action results in the consequences, which is itself sin. So like we read in verse 14, temptations, guys, begin when a person is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now, what does that word mean? Lust, we always... Uh, refer to that in a sexual term, but, but lust is really simply a desire, a strong desire. 
So it's important that we realize that almost every temptation to sin is built upon a legitimate God-given desire. So you can lust after the Spirit of God, okay? And that's okay. You are, have a strong desire to know God and to grow in your spirit toward God. So the problem is, is that Satan knows how to take God's good gifts and mix them with deception and empty promises that entice us, lead us into temptation, and cause us to fail. Now, I love to fish. I'm sure many of y'all have been fishing before. And you don't have to love to fish, or you don't even have to have been fishing often to know, though, that whenever you go fishing, you always have to carry one thing with you. You know what that is? Okay, well, it's more than one thing. You have to carry a pole. But you have to carry bait. You can't catch any fish with a simple hook. You need bait. And if you're a bass fisher, uh, that bait has to look real good because bass, they, they want the best. And so the, everything about that bait is, is designed to entice that bass to bite it. It's, it's bait. Oh, it looks so good. You know, it's basically like a, like a piece of chocolate swimming in the water. I mean, it just looks so good. But what the fish doesn't know is, is that that bait that looks so good has got a hook in it. And that fish doesn't know it until that angler sets that hook. And one thing you need to understand is that Satan is a really good fisher. He has the best baits. He's like the bass pro of lures. He knows exactly what you want. He knows exactly how to get you. And he's going to throw that hook, that, that lure with that hook in it, just right in front of your face and dangle it around, hoping that you'll just take a nibble so he can set that hook deep. Mr. R. Zacharias said this quote, and you may have heard it before. You didn't know who it came from. But he said this, sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and cost you more than you were ever prepared to pay. That's a very true statement. The next step downward in temptation is taken when we allow that desire to lead to disobedience. James chapter 1, 1 verse 15 says that when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, when that sin is, is done, it brings forth death. Now, notice that sin is not conceived until the temptation is accepted and acted upon. Guys, it's not a sin to merely be tempted. There are a lot of godly men out there that have been tempted to do terrible, terrible things. But it was not sin because it was temptation. It was only sin if they fell into that temptation. So in the last part of verse 15, we see that sin always brings about death. Notice what it says there. I want, I want to read that to you again. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Well, Brother Jacob, that's a good point. But why is that then that if sin brings about death, that there are so many bad people in this world that are dying of old age? Why aren't they dying because of their sin in their younger days? Well, for a long time, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that verse. I mean, I, I could read it, but I didn't comprehend what it meant. Um, but the death spoken about here is very different and, and than what you might think of normally. It can come in mainly two different forms. First of all, it can come in the form of eternal death, okay? Eternal death. That means it can come in the, in the form of eternal death, which is the punishment for the sinner that is unrepentant and never turns to Jesus. So if you never accept Jesus as the Lord of your life, your eternal death because of that sin is hell. And that is one form of death that it can take. It can also come in the form of spiritual death. And what you need to understand by that is that sin always separates us from God because God hates sin. That's why we say this term a lot, God hates sin, but not the sinner. God hates sin because sin separates his children from him. Does that mean that saved people can thus lose their salvation? No, that's not what it's saying at all. However, a saved person, someone who at one time was in tune with God, 
can allow unrepentant sin. So sin that you just keep doing over and over again, you don't repent of, you can allow that sin in your life and it can rupture what we call your fellowship with God. So although your relationship is intact, you're still saved, you're still covered by the blood of Jesus. Your sin, though, separates you from the fellowship of God. So that's why I always bring back to the story of the prodigal son when that son took all of his inheritance and went off to live in riotous living. We see that he was out of fellowship with his father, meaning for years maybe he didn't have any time spent with his dad. But it didn't change the fact that it was his dad, much the same way with our sin. Our sin can help us to fall out of fellowship with God, but if we're truly saved, it can't separate us from our eternal security in God. So there's a difference there. So when we have no fellowship with God, in essence, that's a form of death because you feel dead on the inside. That's why God told Adam and Eve when they ate that fruit that they would surely die. Of course, we know that they eventually did die physically, um, but they also died that very day spiritually. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that a spiritual death came because their fellowship with God was broken. You got to remember that they were talking with God. They were walking with God in the midst of the garden before sin. It gives me chills to think about that. Like they could literally go up to God and ask him a question and get the answer right then. And then after sin, they were removed from the garden. They were no longer able to audibly speak back and forth with God. Their whole relationship changed because that sin had separated them from the fellowship that they had with him. So tonight, guys, as I wrap this up, if you're far from God, if you don't feel his presence in your life every day, it could very well be that you've got a sin problem that you've got some unrepentant sin in your life that has caused death in your fellowship with him. And that's a sad time. It is. It can wreck your world. With all that said, though, I want to tell you tonight that there's still hope, okay? Because all of us, myself especially, all of us struggle with sin from time to time. I consider myself a lot like Paul. I don't understand what I'm doing. I don't want to do what I'm doing, but I do it nonetheless out of, out of some compulsion. We all sin. It's how we handle that sin that defines us. When we sin, if we run and hide, if we try to cover it up, if we try to stay away from God, it's just going to continue to wreck our world. But in that moment, because of Jesus, and that's, that's the amazing part, because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we can't go far enough that we can't turn back to him. So I plead with you tonight. First of all, if you're in that form of death, eternal death because your, your sin is separating you from God because you've never had a relationship with him. Guys, right now, right now, I beg you to turn to God. Ask him into your heart. Allow him to change your life and write your name down in the book of life so that when this world is over, you get to go home with him. But I'm also talking to you that's been saved before. You've been baptized before. You have a Bible in your hand maybe right now. But Satan has control of you. He's drawn you away. And you feel powerless. Can I tell you something? You can't change it. Only God can. All you can do is turn from that sin. Stop doing it. Turn from that sin with a repentant heart and ask God to forgive you and walk in a new way. This is the way, walk in it. Broad is the way and wide is the path that leads to destruction, guys. Narrow is the way and difficult is the path that leads to life. And there are few that find it. Live a life worthy of the calling of which you have. Live a life that you serve in such a way that one day Jesus says, yes, welcome home my good and faithful servant.
Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this this week. We'll continue next week with how to deal with this temptation a little bit better. But in the process, I encourage you right now, as soon as this is over with, if you need to spend some time in, in prayer with God, if you need to turn back to him, if you need to rededicate your life, you do whatever you need to right now. Don't wait. Do it now. And if there's anything I can do to help you along the way, you give me a call. I'll be glad to help any way I can. I love you so much. I can't wait to spend time with you. And I hope you have a great and blessed week. See you guys.